So the first thing we're going to do is kind of set the stage for uh, once under the hood of these new uh, performance-based seismic design guidelines uh, that AASHTO has, has recently adopted. But because it's a weekend, I thought I'd start with something a little lighter, uh, but give you a sense of performance-based design is nothing new. In my opinion, all design that's codified, or any design even if it's not codified, is performance-based. There's something you're trying to achieve. So it's kind of an overused word anymore, so we have to talk about what, what does it really mean. So I'm going to go completely off the grid here and give you something else. This was, some of you may be aware of this, but in 1947, a Norwegian named Thor Heyerdahl, uh, trying to prove that people could have migrated from South America into the islands of the Pacific, into the Polynesian islands. Uh, today, the current thinking is people migrated from Southeast Asia. But what he was trying to prove is because of the prevailing wind, you could have sailed from South America to Polynesia. And so he set out to do this. It took 101 days, it went 5,000 miles, landed in French Polynesia, and they used from documentation from the Spanish that had come in years, you know, hundreds of years earlier, um, what the conventional type of boats that these folks built. They used balsa logs, so light uh, wood that floats, and they lashed them together. And there couldn't be any nails, no, no joints, had to be elastic. This starts to sound like modern seismic design, and in their 1950 movie documentary uh, on this, there was a quote. You know, Among the primitive races, the golden rule was don't resist nature, yield to her command, and accommodate. That's basically what the Ashto seismic design provisions do today and what the ACI and, um, and building code seismic design provisions provide. So... Uh, again, to kind of go back and quote Hardy Cross, strength is essential but otherwise unimportant because we need ductility, deflection, uh, stability, those sorts of things. Okay, so now we'll move back to the present. So this national, this was sponsored as a national cooperative highway research in CHRP project, 12106 is their numbering scheme. This was the team. Uh, you may know some of these people, some of these people are in the room today, uh, but we had uh, design firms, universities, uh, and even uh, USGS involved in, in this project. And so what, we, what I'm going to do today with this presentation is provide you a bit of context and overview of these guidelines, describe its relationship with the AASHTO documents that are already out there, give you some information where you can find these, uh, and, and then a, an introduction to the content of these guidelines. And we'll, we'll start with a simple, or I'll, I'll provide a simple example outlining the results, um, but this will move to the second presentation and the third presentation where we go into um, many more examples. So the motivation behind this, the current main spec of AASHTO is the LRFD force the LRFD spec, which the seismic provisions are force-based, uh, they're primarily prescriptive, so they're not really performance-based at all. You use R factors, you satisfy prescriptive detailing provisions, and hope that you have the displacement capacity um, that, that will prevail if you have a, a design earthquake. Parallel to that, and sitting at an equal level, is the AASHTO seismic guide spec, which is displacement-based, it addresses, though, only other bridges, or now what we're calling ordinary bridges, but you do explicitly check displacement capacity. And there's only one limit state. That's the life safety limit state that's checked there. So it's no collapse. So it's, um, it's a felt to be a better approach than the force-based. It is nominally performance-based, but doesn't uh, include multiple levels. And so uh, if you go back and look at the Ashton spec, um, it addresses critical, what used to be called essentials, now called recovery, 
and then ordinary bridges. So the seismic guide spec only addresses ordinary or other bridges, so we needed to fill that gap. That's part of the purpose of the development of these guidelines. Owners also needed you know, more design methodology options and doors to open for uh, bridges that don't necessarily fit within the design uh, constraints of the seismic guide spec. And so one of those was two level designs. Some states like to have uh, a lower level where you have no damage and then an upper level and you may choose that upper level based on the needs post earthquake uh, of that bridge. So what does that look like? So the, the two specifications from AASHTO are shown on the left, the LRFD spec I just mentioned and the LRFD seismic uh, guideline, guide spec. These are specifications, so they are mandatory. Uh, the guidelines that I'm talking about today are optional for owners to use, so they don't sit at the same level as a, as a specification, uh, but fill in some of the gaps. This arose out of a synthesis document, this NCHRP synthesis 440, shown in the red there. Uh, and you can download these uh, for free from the NC, uh, TRB website. Then that synthesis document that gathered what different states, different people were doing, what research had been done, uh, led to uh, this 12106 project, which uh, resulted in this research report 949. So this uh, you can download right now um, on the TRB website, or National Academies Press. And then in 2020, the AASHTO, the AASHTO um, Committee on Bridge and Structures meeting, uh, we balloted a uh, set of guidelines that came out of this research report and, and the table of contents is shown over here on the right. That was balloted and approved by AASHTO, so it moves into the AASHTO family of documents, but it is not on the streets yet. It's still in publication by AASHTO. It's taken them quite a while. I don't know if this is COVID, you know, what. Um, I checked this morning, still not available in the AASHTO store, but it should be available soon. So right now, this is the important part, right now the primary reference for you, if you're interested in this, is that green report 949. So let's kind of start to look under the hood of what motivated this and, and how it works. So if you wanted to think of how performance-based seismic design would ultimately look long view in the future, we would have a process that links seismic hazard, the structural analysis, damage analysis, all the way to loss analysis of you know dollars to replace, downtime, uh, deaths, sort of the three Ds I've heard them called. <laughs> uh, and we're, all this would be on a probabilistic basis tied together. Well, our seismic hazard's on a pretty solid probabilistic basis, uh, but the other three dots are not. We're moving in that, that direction, but it'll be quite a while before we fill up the blue arrow. Uh, this you know, blurry figure down at the bottom is, has the same categories and is meant to show, again, the elements of performance-based design and the probabilistic going from the location and the design to uh, decision-making variables such as dollars and downtime. Uh, it, most organizations are not really set up yet with a decision-making process based on all these mathematical objective things. There's a lot of subjective information that goes into this. So we're working our, our way through the process and these guidelines that I'm going to talk about today are a step in that direction. So the guidelines are displacement based. That's important in terms of checking uh, the limit states. A force based limit state really has no meaning once you get into large inelastic deformations. Their capacity uh, design based. There are three operational categories. That's something new here. Um, the operational categories would be uh, critical, recovery, and ordinary. And those terms now have been adopted by AASHTO. They are in LRFD and in the guide spec. 
critical recovery in ordinary. That was a change made just a couple of years ago in, in conjunction with this. Those have been published. Uh, there are three performance levels. Life safety, which is the one we're used to dealing with. That's no collapse, nobody gets killed. That's performance level one. Performance level two is operational, which means that there's some damage, but emergency vehicles, uh, for example, can still use the bridge, but it may not be open to the, to the public and may require some repair. And then performance level three, which is fully operational, which in essence is no damage, elastic response, uh, which uh, could be a choice made. Obviously, you pay more dollars uh, as you go to the, to the higher performance levels. There are uh, two ground motions. So both the AASHTO documents right now have a single ground motion, but with this, these guidelines that can sit on top of the seismic guide spec have um, two ground motion levels. That's a 100-year uh, ground motion and the thousand year. Thousand year return period is the, the natural basis for the, the AASHTO uh, documents at the moment. The lower level 100 years matches to the Federal Highways Retrofit Manual. So we're trying, as we went through this process, we're trying to uh, make sure that other documents that were in use out there by designers meshed with this. In other words, if you went to the limit say, I want to look at a lower level earthquake, um, it matches what Federal Highways has for the lower, their lower, lower level event. A comment here is some people think of performance-based design as simply two level earthquake. Performance-based design is a lot more than that, and hopefully you'll, you'll get that from this presentation. <coughs> there are uh, four hazard levels. And that is similar to what we have today in the AASHTO document. So again, these are consistent, uh, as consistent as we could make them to the existing AASHTO documents. And then there are uh, a number of seismic design categories. Currently in the AASHTO family, the design categories which govern detailing, analysis techniques, that sort of thing, are A, B, C, and D. And now you see numbers attached with this, and this has to do with the combinations of the two level earthquakes and the combinations of the performance levels. And, and then this last, these last two bullets I've mentioned already is that we want to be consistent with the seismic guide spec and the Federal Highways Retrofit Manual, and we also uh, lean on the seismic guide specifications heavily with this document. So rather than repeat all the uh, details that you really need to design a bridge, we use what's already out there in the specifications and add on to the top of those with these guidelines. So um, the design parameters, so I picked out just a reinforced concrete design here to show you some of the how the uh, performance levels are based mathematically and this is probably the most common substructure and inelastic element that's used in bridge design. It's strain-based, as is the seismic guide spec, but the strain limits are different. There's a strain limit for tension and, compre and compression, um, and the tension limits the strain in the steel. Right now, if you're designing with the guide spec, you just have a flat strain limit that's in a table. You don't know where it comes from. Here, it's limited by bar buckling, uh, and I'll explain that in the next slide, but this bar buckling is when we start to lose lateral strength. And so there are different levels provided for, you can see, the performance level. So the bar buckling, basic bar buckling equations given in the first column under life safety, and then 80% of that is used for the operational performance level, uh, just 80% of the equation in the first column. And then for fully operational, have a flat strain limit that keeps things basically less than yield. The concrete compressive strain limit is based on the Mander compression model, which is what is in the guide spec now. Um, but at PL1, it's 1.4 times that, which takes you to a median value of Mander's concrete strain. PL2 is uh, the basic a lower level, and that is similar to what's in the guide spec right now, and then the PL3 is uh, a lower level to keep you essentially elastic. 
there are a number of engineering design parameters that should be added to this document. And this is a right place for research here and improvements in various elements. So if you look at the AASHTO specifications right now, there's not very much on walls, piles, reinforced concrete, uh, filled steel tubes, steel columns, geotechnical information. There's a lot of geotechnical information, but in terms of these engineering design parameters, what are the actual limits that we want? Uh, there's quite a bit of opportunity to fill in more data. So that's where you know we're still going along this arc of improving our design procedures. This is a place where improvements could be made. So I said I would explain the bar buckling business. Uh, and tie that into the performance in terms of uh, lateral force versus displacement, say, of a column into the inelastic range. And so just qualitatively, you see this you know, onset of spalling of the cover concrete, uh, potentially transverse steel yield, then incipient bar buckling, that's what we were just talking about, and then the concrete strain limits. So if we go to the figures on the right, uh, what happens if you load these reinforced concrete elements into, in, in, into the inelastic range and flexure, you'll stretch the tensile steel, and then eventually the transverse steel is not capable of preventing local buckling of those longitudinal bars. And once that occurs, then you've got very high strains localized, and it only takes a few cycles before you start to fracture bars and that leads to loss of lateral strength. So the bar buckling is really what we need to stay uh, within to have operational performance. And the way the testing instrumentation has been developed in recent years, we're much better able to identify incipient bar buckling. When you're trying to do this by eye, by the time you can see it, uh, just in the lab walking around the column, it's too late. Uh, you need to see this incipient bar buckling earlier, and that's what uh, modern, more modern instrumentation has led to the establishment of the strain limits that I gave on the previous slide. Now, the, the Mander model is based on uniform compression, and we take it and extrapolate it into this flexure system. And that's been, that system has been criticized over the years, but it's still a reasonable way to do it. Um, there's just that inconsistency um, right now. So then back to the other figure, in the lower limit we show again qualitatively repairability and also reuse. Um, so you know over uh, on the left hand side no repair and then as you go you get to you know patching, epoxy injection, that sort of thing, maybe finally jacketing significant repair could be re replacement of an entire element. Um, even in the Nisqually earthquake in Seattle, uh, we replaced all the concrete out of a column but left the steel in the column. The column failed in shear. Uh, so longitudinal bars were good, but the transverse were not and the concrete was not. So um, it's been said uh, by wiser people than me that anything's repairable, it's just a matter of how much money you want to spend. <laughs> So moving on, seismic hazard levels, the four shown there, uh, those are based on the one second spectral acceleration uh, and based on site adjusted uh, one second spectral accelerations. Those are the same break points as we have currently in the AASHTO specification. So again, we're consistent there. But now this new table expands hazard level as a function of performance level and the lower and upper level events. And then we've added a, a new thing called bridge attributes, which are, you have basic, very simple bridge, to sort of an intermediate or, com um, or complex bridge, and then finally, truly complex bridge. Some bridges are not covered by the guide spec, for example, um, and they're not covered directly by strain limits in this spec, and they require project-specific criteria. Um, signature bridges, big long span arch bridges, cable stay bridges, that sort of thing, um, much different than the bridges that the guide spec and the AASHTO uh, design provisions intend to cover. But we've tried to envelop that with these guidelines. So 
uh, at the very high end, you end up with project-specific criteria, uh, but the, these are then, quote, covered by the, the guidelines. The, and a criticism of, of AASHTO is, like, what do you do for a table state structure in seismic design? And I know you can't read this, but and these are figures from that report 949 that show you, uh, in essence, requirements based on seismic design category, which increases with the seismic hazard um, and with the performance level. So you see now a letter, which is similar to the existing design categories, and a number, which is related to the performance level. And you have upper level and lower level ground motion. So obviously there are different analysis techniques that you have to deal with. In low seismic areas, like we're in Texas right now, we're in the lower design category A. Uh, we're doing, we're not doing pushover analysis. We're not doing a lot of the really rigorous stuff that we would do, say, in the Pacific Northwest or in the New Madrid area or in South Carolina. Um, so. The differences there are lined out in general here, and then within the flow chart of the design guidelines, these are expanded upon. This is a similar format to what's in the uh, guide specification now, just as a, a real high level, what's included in this particular design category. A, a really good measure of this is where do you check um, true inelastic um, shear capacity of your element. In other words, if you have plastic hinging and you need to design for shear counting on degradation in the, in, in the plastic hinge zones, uh, where do you start to, to do that? Well, these design categories point you in that direction. So in Texas, you're probably not doing that, uh, but in other areas you would be. And then this further spreads out the um, design requirements, uh, explicitly linking your performance level, your hazard level, design category uh, to the type of demand analysis is, that you're doing, um, going from equivalent static analysis or even no analysis all the way up to nonlinear time history or response history analysis. And then the capacity assessment, um, these are methodologies that are outlined in the current guide specification. So it, it links these in with the performance level and the uh, design category. And then I mentioned, I've saved this for last, I mentioned the bridge attributes. This is new in the guides, uh, guidelines here. And we've got basic, which is very simple bridge, uh, typically linear soils, um, you know, two span overcrossing on really good soil. You're probably not going to do nonlinear time history analysis of that type of bridge because you don't have the fee, uh, based, which is based on construction value, to do that. And so that would fall under, say, the basic category. Then as we get into poorer soils and some irregular geometry, um, skew, curves, that sort of thing, maybe different pier heights, you move into the intermediate category. Um, you may have liquefaction hazard, that sort of thing, and then moderate to high value of construction. So if you've got some of these um, more acute hazards like liquefaction on the site, the fee to do the engineering is going to be higher. Um, and then finally, if you have a very complex bridge and let's say, you know, cable state structure, that's a high value of construction. There's more fee there, so you can do more in, in terms of the analysis and, and design. And you should. Uh, now, these are subjective terms. We don't really try to, to you know, pin those to a dollar value today, but it's just useful as a way of thinking. And the owner, in setting up a project, has to agree on here's which way we're going to do this. But this complex category of attributes uh, will pick up projects that are not covered now by the guide spec um, and may point you into, in many cases, will point you into project specific criteria, which is fine. So we're trying to just put all this in one bucket here, even though we can't do it perfectly. Other elements that are included in the, in the uh, guidelines, there's a design flow chart that I didn't try to reproduce here, but you can go to that report and look at 
that if you're interested. There's a bunch of guidance on modeling and analysis that goes a little more in depth than what's in the guide specification right now, um, even including software validation, you know, checking your software that it does indeed produce the results that you think it does. There's uh, a lot of guidance on uh, geotechnical characterization of your site. This builds upon what's in the guide specification in LRFD right now. Um, ground response analysis, uh, bringing, uh, you know, shaking values up through soil columns or doing, you know, different types of ground response analysis. And then displacement limits uh, based on uh, geotechnical attributes. Now, it's been said that the soil is infinitely uh, deformable or ductile. So any displacement limits that are under the category of geotechnical typically are displacement limit of your structure. How far can your structure go uh, without unseating, you know, that sort of thing. Then in the guidelines, there's a design example. It's going to be a topic of uh, one of the uh, next presentations of three-span bridge design in New Madrid, uh, so the central U.S. Uh, there's a column design study, which I'm going to talk about next, which just looks at typical columns and how do they fare uh, in this new system relative to what we have in Ashto right now. And then importantly, there is a di direct displacement based design example that's included in an appendix. This is the first time that uh, direct displacement based design has been included in an Ashto document. So this is a real step forward uh, to the future to have this and if we've got time uh, we'll have a, a short presentation on that today. This gives you just a glimpse of the direct displacement based design and it, I, I took a figure from Mervyn Kowalski's and Nigel Priestley's book on, uh, on this topic shows a building you can just as well use a bridge where you take your multi degree of freedom structure essentially turn it into a single degree of freedom uh, and instead of looking at the initial stiffness prior to yield, which is what Ashto does, you look at a secant stiffness at your design point. And then with that, you characterize an amount of damping that's based on that displacement or displacement ductility and based on the type of structure you have uh, and come up with an equivalent elastic damping uh, and then apply that to come up with a displacement of your structure. So this is a complete parallel universe to what's done in Ashto. And I'll mention this several times in the coming presentations. Uh, Ashto uses this linear elastic model. And if you think about it, we're doing linear elastic analysis to try to predict the response of an inelastic structure. That is a major leap of faith. You know, if you, if you really think about it. But in Ashto, it's almost buried. You don't even know that you're doing that. This kind of goes by the tagline, equal displacement. It's been around for 50 years. Uh, but it's really an empirical uh, study of elastic models and yielding models and trying to say, well, if you had this elastic response, here's what we would expect out of an inelastic response. It's pretty crude. The direct displacement-based design allows much more refinement to that, but it is a totally different way of, of estimating inelastic response and is better. So that's why it's now in the spec or in the guidelines. Then I mentioned the single degree of freedom column study, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. You'll see more of these slides in the next presentation, so I'm not going to say much more than we looked at a bunch of different sites. Um, and looked at the different strain limits and then plotted those uh, in a shear force versus displacement format. We'll come back to that in the next presentation, so I don't think we need to take time right now for that. And so in summary, these new guidelines fill a definite need and gap in the AASHTO documents uh, because they address things that we currently do not address. Um, the framework is something that you can add new techniques to and expand for future structure types you, you know, we have better information on. And maybe someday, and I would say this is long view, this is like 20 years perhaps, given the, my <laughs> observation of how Ashto moves, um, 
it may take quite a while to wrap this completely into the current specifications. That said, um, one of the big steps forward in ASHTO came when we had the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake in California and there was a big push nationally to let's update the seismic spec. So sometimes uh, you have an event that accelerates things. So I said 20 years, but we could have an event tomorrow and it could be two years. So uh, you never know. But you are here today uh, seeing at least some of a glimpse of the future of what's coming out. So with that, I will stop and we will move on. Well, I'll take a few questions. Uh, I've taken about half an hour here, so we probably need to move on pretty quickly. Uh, but are there questions? Yes. Um, we had, so the question is, have we looked at aftershocks and their effects? Um, we did not in a formal sense here, more of a qualitative sense. Um, I would say that I recently was reviewing a paper that looks at this, and so I'm saying this is um, kind of new emerging work, uh, which interestingly, that paper is looking at which side of that bar buckling you're on. And so um, with aftershocks, the question would be, can you leave the bridge open? Does it need to be repaired? What kind of repair? And so it really matters how far out that load displacement <coughs> curve you went. If you are under the bar buckling level, it's repairable, and there seems to be quite a lot of life left in, in the elements. If you're past bar buckling, uh, and say if you were past the PL2 performance limit now to life safety, uh, you may not have the ability to handle a number of aftershocks, kind of depends on how high they are. And we all know that different types of seismic uh, regimes, you know, tectonic regimes, produce different numbers and intensities of aftershocks. So uh, that's a qualitative answer here that I'm giving. Yes, another question back here. Um, and could you use the microphone? I have a problem. So, can you please go back to the temporary short experience? Either one of you can use it. Yes, I can. 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 Yes, I So, are these performance levels, like life safety operational and duty operational, being connected to the return period of the operator? That whether it's a hundred year or a thousand year of the future, considered in each of the cases? I'm not sure I caught the last part of the question. Could you repeat yeah. it? So the life safety strain question, so suppose I am the client, I am going to build a bridge. Okay. So I have to make a decision that whether I will go with the life safety stage, operational stage, or fully operational stage. So what my understanding will be from the client perspective is if I am considering a thousand year return period, I would like to go with the life safety. Which will allow for a maximum amount of the strain in the structure and because since the, the, of the probability of occurrence of the earthquake will be less, so I can allow for a greater amount of the strain. So that's the reason I'm, I'm asking that are these conditions being related to the return period of the earthquake and the levels of the earthquake? Yeah, so the question is, are these strain limits related to the return period of the earthquake? And in this guideline, yes, they are. So we have an upper level event that say we're putting life safety at a thousand year return period. And that means that the structure should not collapse in that if you had that thousand year earthquake. Now, one of the things we always know is you never get the design earthquakes, either going to be less or more. And you can look at some parts of the country, for example, California, the you know thousand year event and a, say a two thousand year event are perhaps not that different. If you look on the other hand, in Memphis, Tennessee, say, the thousand year event and the twenty five hundred or two thousand year event could be quite different. And so depending on the importance of your bridge. This, and this guideline allows this kind of flexibility in design. The conversation with the owner would be, if you want you know, performance in an earthquake that has a higher return period than the design spec does right now, you're free to do that. 
and you might move this PL1 up to a higher level. And in fact, this is kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but recently ASHTO has adopted risk-targeted ground motions at this upper level. They're in the process of uh, being published right now, so again, it's going to be a while before they're actually out ready to use. But that risk-targeted approach, much like was done on the building side with risk-targeting, uh, tries to smooth out those differences regionally of different earthquake return periods and their intensity. They're not the same across the country. And so um, there is the ability to mix, mix and match here based on owner's preference. Um, and if they want to, you know, the minimum, and that's kind of the way it's been set, minimum design requirement is the uh, upper level has to be 1,000. This doesn't allow you to go to 500. Uh, you have to at least go to 1,000 year return period, and you may choose to go further and apply different strain limits depending on is your bridge on a you know, a critical corridor that you want to keep open or is very expensive to replace, that sort of thing.